Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Tuesday, March 26, 2024. Supreme Court hears a case challenging the FDA's approval of a medication abortion drug, mifepristone, making it more widely available. But many of the justices question whether the anti-abortion doctors and groups that brought the case have standing the right to sue. We'll hear parts of today's oral argument and talk with Politico health care reporter Alice Miranda Olstein. Search and rescue continues for the construction workers who were on the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore when it was hit by a large cargo ship and the bridge collapsed into the river very early this morning. Both Maryland Governor Wes Moore and President Joe Biden say early indications are that this was an accident, but the National Transportation Safety Board will investigate. And the NTSB chair, Jennifer Homedy, spoke today near the crash site. President Biden also says he is mobilizing federal resources to open the port of Baltimore as soon as possible and wants the federal government to pay to rebuild the bridge. Independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. chooses a vice presidential running mate. It's tech attorney and entrepreneur Nicole Shanahan. And one of the issues she talks about today is treating and curing chronic disease. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin meets Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant at the Pentagon, saying the two plan to discuss alternative approaches to target Hamas and Rafah in southern Gaza, where over a million Palestinians are sheltering. Alternative in this case means to Israel's already planned assault. And NASA Administrator Bill Nelson reflects on the solar eclipse set to move across 15 U.S. states in about two weeks, about the emotional effect it can have on people thinking of the workings of the universe, and the great chance to do science experiments on the sun and its effects on the earth. We start at the Supreme Court where, while the justices heard the oral argument in the case about the abortion pill mifepristone, the case is FDA v. Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine. Outside, there were protesters both for and against. Psychological and emotional injury because they have been rushed through the chemical abortion process without the opportunity. Outside the Supreme Court today, ABC News reports the U.S. Capitol Police arrested 13 protesters who were illegally blocking roads and a walkway. Alice Miranda Oldstein, Politico's health care reporter, has co authored an article that begins the Supreme Court on Tuesday appeared skeptical of an effort to restrict access to a widely used abortion pill with conservative and liberal justices alike, raising questions about whether anti-abortion doctors can prove concrete injuries that give them standing to sue and whether a national judicial ruling rolling back availability of the drug is justified. She joins us now on the phone. Thanks for being with us. You were in the Supreme Court courtroom listening to the oral argument. What did you hear? Yes, it was uh, really fascinating, and I think there was a lot more skepticism of the anti-abortion groups challenging these FDA policies than a lot of people expected, and skepticism in particular from the more conservative wing of the court. Of course, um, as expected, you had Justices Thomas and Alito really um, going hard in favor of the anti-abortion group's side, but you had some real sharp questioning from uh, Justices Amy Coney Barrett and Justice Gorsuch in particular, um, who were really echoing some concerns you were hearing from the more liberal wing of the court saying, one, we're we're not convinced that these doctors um, who claim that the availability of abortion pills means that they might have to treat someone someday who came in after taking one of those pills, and therefore they should have the right to, you know, challenge the whole policy and get it struck down nationwide. Your article identifies Neil Gorsuch and Amy Coney Barrett as the key votes. Is is that the way it may shake out? Well, you you need at least five, and the three more liberal justices on the court um, were pretty clear about where they stand. You know, they don't think that um, the FDA's judgment on here, scientific judgment in how the pill should be regulated, should be questioned. And so if, you know, as was indicated today, Amy Coney Barrett and Neil Gorsuch joined them, then uh, you would not have the votes needed to make this big change. This case was brought under the assumption that the FDA had had not abided by its own scientific policies when approving the wider availability of this abortion pill. If this case is decided on standing, what happens to that underlying issue? 
That's a great question. Um, so it very well may, may be decided on standing or something more procedural and not really get at the heart of the case, which would, of course, leave the door open in the future to um, to other challenges aimed at restricting access to the pills, restricting access to abortion in general. Um, you know, I think if they just say, hey, these specific plaintiffs don't clear the bar, then the search will go on for plaintiffs who do. We're talking with Alice Miranda Olstein, a reporter with Politico. In a preview article you wrote, could a decision ban the abortion pill? Most likely not. Is that still true after hearing the oral argument? So there were um, multiple petitions to the Supreme Court about what to consider in this case. And there was one that went to what would constitute a de facto national ban, questioning the original FDA approval more than two decades ago of this drug, Mifepristone. The Supreme Court said, we don't want to hear that part of the case. They did take the part of the case that is about more recent FDA policies that have expanded access to the pills. And so if a ruling just on those policies were to go forward, it would mean national restrictions, but not a national ban. Of course, the court can do whatever it wants. It can go beyond, you know, just the arguments presented to them. And, you know, during today's oral arguments, a few of the justices, you know, seemed pretty eager to do that. You had, um, A couple different justices, uh, Justice Thomas and Justice Alito, bring up the Comstock Act. That's this long dormant uh, law from the 1870s that bans mail delivery of anything that could potentially be used for an abortion. Um, And so they seem very interested in pursuing national abortion restrictions through that mechanism, even though that's not, you know, directly at issue in this case. And so it's it's some signaling for what they could consider in the future. This is a highly watched decision. This is an election year. Could that play into how the justices decide? Well, I think that, you know, the credibility of the court and the perception that the court is politicized is definitely on some of the justices' minds. We've heard, you know, the Chief Justice, John Roberts, you know, raise that concern specifically. And I think there is an awareness that, you know, just like the Dobbs decision came down in the summer of 2022 and really had a huge impact on the midterms later that same year and on many elections since, that this has the potential to have a similar effect coming down just a few months before people start voting in the presidential election and, you know, to determine control of Congress. And so I think it's it's definitely out there. There was not a mention of it during today's arguments, but I, I think it is not far from anyone's mind. Alice Miranda Olstein is a healthcare reporter with Politico. Her stories are at politico.com and on X at Alice Olstein. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now some of today's oral argument, Justice Samuel Alito questioning the U.S. Solicitor General Elizabeth Prelocker about standing. Could you provide a more specific answer to the first question that Justice Thomas asked you? Is there anybody who could challenge in court the lawfulness of what the FDA did here? In this particular case, I think the answer is no. Well, that wasn't my question. Is there anybody who can do that. Let's, let's start with the states that intervened below. Uh, will you uh, say uh, in that litigation, fine, you can challenge it, and let's get to the, to the merits of this issue, the lawfulness of what the FDA did? No, we think the states lack standing. They're asserting indirect injuries that would, if it provided a basis for standing, mean that states could always sue the federal government. And the court cautioned against that result in United States versus Texas, footnote three of that decision. Okay. How about a a doctor who opposes abortion? So she's on duty in an emergency room when a woman comes in with complications from having taken mifeprestone, and the doctor is the only one there uh, on duty who can attend to this woman's problem, and as a result, in order to save her life, the doctor has to abort a viable fetus. Now, would that doctor then have standing to seek injunctive relief, or would you say that's too speculative? This was like being struck by lightning, and there's no, uh, it's not sufficiently likely that this is going to happen to this doctor again. 
We would agree that that would represent past harm, so we're not disputing that that kind of conscience violation, providing care in violation of one's conscience, would be cognizable. But yes, we think that that situation has never come to pass. Respondents haven't identified any incident in more than 20 years that Mifepristone has been available on the market that resembles that kind of hypothetical situation. And so, yes, our view would be it's unduly speculative. And you have to think about all of the events that would have to transpire to get to that moment sure, in no, time. Sure, I, I understand the argument. Now, how about a woman who suffers adversity consequences from having taken mifepristone, would she be able to sue for damages? Or you would say that's barred by sovereign immunity? I expect that we would have sovereign immunity arguments in that kind of case. I, re- I recognize that respect, with respect to traceability, that's a harder argument for us. U.S. Solicitor General Elizabeth Prelogger, questioned by Supreme Court Justice Samuel Lido in today's oral argument in the case FDA v. Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine. Arguing on behalf of the doctors who brought the case, Aaron Hawley, senior counsel with the group Alliance Defending Freedom. Here questioned by Justice Katanji Brown-Jackson. I mean, it makes perfect sense for the individual doctors to seek an exemption. But as I understand it, they already have that. Um, And so what they're asking for here is that in order to um, prevent them from possibly ever having to do these kinds of procedures, everyone else should be prevented from getting access to this medication. So why isn't that um, plainly overbroad uh, scope of the remedy the end of this case? So with respect to the premise of that question, Justice Jackson, um, I don't think our doctors necessarily um, are are able to object for two reasons. Uh, One of this this is the emergency nature of these procedures. Uh, As the FDA acknowledges, many women do go to the emergency room. And if we just think about what that might look like, um, take Dr. Francis. Uh, She's on the labor and delivery floor supervising. I'm sorry. I don't want to hypothesize. Tell me in her declaration where she talks about not being able to object or uh, pose a conscientious objection. She talks about, Your Honor, being an... uh, I mean, can you point me to any place in the declarations where a declarant states that they attempted to object but were unable to? No, Your Honor, for two reasons. One, these are emergency situations. Respondent doctors don't necessarily know until they scrub into that operating room whether this may or may not be abortion drug harm. It could be a miscarriage, it could be an ectopic pregnancy, um, or it could be an elective abortion, Your Honor. In addition, the government simply cannot get its story straight on Imtala. If you look at the district court brief in that case, uh, we just heard that the church amendment applies. And while we would love for this court to adopt that position, they told the district court the very opposite. All right. Let Let me ask you this. If we were to find that there are conscientious objections that, uh, say, hospitals take them into account and these doctors do have a way to not do these kinds of procedures, should we end this case on that basis? No, Your Honor. We would welcome that holding, um, but it's not broad enough to remedy our doctor's harm. Why? Because these are emergency situations, they they can't waste precious moments scrubbing in. uh, No, no, no. I'm saying I'm saying assuming we have a world in which they can actually lodge the objections that you say that they have. My question is, isn't that enough to remedy their issue? Do we have to also entertain your argument that no one else in the world can have this drug or no one else in America uh, should have this drug in order to protect your clients? So again, Your Honor, it's not possible given the emergency nature of these situations. Aaron Hawley, senior counsel with the group Alliance Defending Freedom, questioned by Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Brown-Jackson. The case FDA v. Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine argued today. Oral argument runs about an hour and a half. We covered it all on C-SPAN Radio, and it's available at our website, cspan.org. Associated Press article about the case has this paragraph. The practical consequences of a ruling for abortion opponents would be dramatic, including possibly halting the delivery of mifepristone through the mail and at large pharmacy chains and ending increasingly popular telehealth visits at which the drug can be prescribed. This is Washington Today. Baltimore Sun reports a massive container ship adrift at nine miles per hour issued a May Day early Tuesday as it headed toward the iconic Francis Scott Key Bridge, losing power before colliding with one of the bridge's support columns. As the vessel struck the bridge, it caused a din that could be heard ashore and immediately toppled an essential mid Atlantic thoroughfare into the frigid waters. Several cars were knocked into the Patapsco River. 
And as of Tuesday around 11 a.m., authorities were searching for six construction workers who had been repairing potholes on the bridge. Two others were rescued, one who was briefly hospitalized and another who declined to go to a hospital. Extensive rescue efforts were ongoing. That from the Baltimore Sun. And this morning, Maryland Governor Wes Moore held a news conference in Baltimore. I recognize that many of us are hurting right now. I recognize that many of us are scared right now. And so I want to be very clear about where everything stands. We are still investigating what happened, but we are quickly gathering details. The preliminary investigation points to an accident. We haven't seen any credible evidence of a terrorist attack. Our administration is working closely with leaders from all levels of government and society to respond to this crisis and not but just by addressing the immediate aftermath, but also by building a state that is more resilient and a state that's more safe. That is our pledge and that's our commitment and we're going to keep that commitment. And lastly, to the victims of this tragedy and their loved ones. All of our hearts are broken. We feel your loss. We're thinking of you. And we will always be thinking of you. We pray for the construction workers who are on the key bridge. And we pray for everyone who has been touched by this tragedy and their families and all of their loved ones. But Maryland, we will get through this because that is the Maryland spirit. And that's what Maryland is made of. We are Maryland tough, and we are Baltimore strong. Maryland Governor Wes Moore in Baltimore this morning, joined by the mayor, Brendan Scott, U.S. Senator from Maryland, Chris Van Hollen, other state and local officials. There was another news conference in the afternoon where the other U.S. Senator from Maryland, Ben Cardin, attended. Governor Moore said after the crew on the ship notified authorities that they had lost power, officials stopped traffic so that more cars were not on the bridge. When that hit, potentially saving more lives, Governor Moore also thanking the first responders. Congressman Kwesi and Fume, who represents the area, posting on X, the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse is an unthinkable horror. We are all trying to respond accordingly. I've spoken directly with Secretary Buttigieg and the White House. They are responding with all the assets at their disposal. Our prayers right now are for the missing individuals and victims of this tragedy. We thank God for the effective service of our first responders. He was referring to the Transportation Secretary, Pete Buttigieg. At about 1 p.m. Eastern, President Joe Biden spoke at the White House. At about 1.30, container ships struck the Francis Scott Key Bridge, which I've been over many, many times commuting from the state of Delaware to our trainer by car. I've been in Baltimore Harbor many times. And uh, the bridge collapsed, sending several people and vehicles into the water, into the river. And uh, multiple U.S. Coast Guard units, which are stationed very nearby, thank God, were immediately deployed along with local emergency personnel. And the Coast Guard is leading the response to the port, where representatives from the Federal Highway Administration, the FBI, the Department of Transportation, the Army Corps of Engineers, as well as Maryland officials in Baltimore Police and Fire are all working together to coordinate an emergency response. Officials at the scene estimate eight people were unaccounted for still. Not still, were unaccounted for. That number might change. Two have been rescued, one without injury, one in critical condition. And the search and rescue operation is continuing for all those remaining as we speak. I spoke with Governor Moore this morning, as well as the mayor of Baltimore, the county executive, to both the United States senators and the congressman. And my secretary of transportation is on the scene. I told them we're going to send all the federal resources they need as we respond to this emergency. And I mean all the federal resources. And we're going to rebuild that port together. Everything so far indicates that this was a terrible accident. At this time, we have no other indication, no other reason to believe there's any intentional act here. Personnel on board the ship were able to alert the Maryland Department of Transportation that they had lost control of their vessel, as you all know and reported. As a result, local authorities were able to close the bridge to traffic before the bridge was struck, which undoubtedly saved lives. And our prayers are with everyone involved in this terrible accident and all the families, especially those waiting for the news of their loved one right now. I know every minute in that circumstance feels like a lifetime. You just don't know. It's just terrible. We're incredibly grateful for the brave rescuers who immediately rushed to the scene 
and to the people of Baltimore who want to say, we're with you. We're going to stay with you as long as it takes. And like the governor said, you're Maryland tough, you're Baltimore strong, and we're going to get through this together. And I promise we're not leaving. Here's what's happening now. The search and rescue operation is our top priority. Ship traffic in the Port of Baltimore has been suspended until further notice. And we'll need to clear that channel before the sh ship traffic can resume. The Army Corps of Engineers is on the spot and is going to help lead this effort to clear the channel. The Port of Baltimore is one of the nation's largest shipping hubs. And I've been there a number of times as a senator and as a vice president. It handles a record amount of cargo last year. It's also the top port in America for both imports and exports of automobiles and light trucks. Around 850,000 vehicles go through that port every single year. And we're going to get it up and running again as soon as possible. 15,000 jobs depend on that port. And we're going to do everything we can to protect those jobs and help those workers. The bridge is also critical to, for travel, not just for Baltimore, but for the Northeast Corridor. Over 30,000 vehicles cross the Francis Scott Key Bridge on a daily basis. <clears throat> it's virtually, uh, it's a, well, it's one of the most important elements for the economy in the Northeast and the quality of life. My transportation secretary is there now. As I told Governor Moore, I've directed my team to move heaven and earth to reopen the port and rebuild the bridge as soon as humanly possible. And we're going to work hand in hand with the support of Maryland to support Maryland and whatever they ask for. We're going to work with our partners in Congress to make sure the state gets the support it needs. It's my intention that federal government will pay for the entire cost of reconstructing that bridge. And I expect to, the Congress to support my effort. This is going to take some time. The people of Baltimore can count on us, though, to stick with them at every step of the way until the port is reopened and the bridge is rebuilt. You know, we're not leaving until this job gets done. Not leaving until then. So I just want to say God bless everybody who uh, got everyone harmed this morning and their families. And may God bless the first responders, who many of whom risk their lives. And uh, I'm going to, the reason I'm not going to take a lot of questions, there's remaining issues that are open that we've got to determine what's going to happen in terms of the rescue mission and the like. But I'll. Do you, do you plan to go to Baltimore, sir? And if so, how quickly? I do, and as quickly as I can. That's what we're you said the federal government's also going to pay for the repairs. I'm just curious, this was a ship that appears to be at fault. Is there any reason to believe that the company behind the ship should be held responsible? And then also, you that mentioned. That could be, but we're not going to wait for that happen. We're going to pay for it to get the bridge rebuilt and open. President Biden today at the White House, the Francis Scott Key Bridge, named for Francis Scott Key, the author of the national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, was opened in 1977, spans the Patapsco River in the port of Baltimore. It was 1.6 miles. Later, NTSB Chair Jennifer Homendy held a news conference in Baltimore saying the investigation is just getting started, so there's no firm answer yet as to what happened. Also, she said the search and rescue is still the priority. On behalf of the NTSB, I want to extend our deepest sympathies to those who have been affected by this significant event. Uh, the NTSB, as I mentioned, does uh, many uh, significant transportation ev events, uh, not, just mer uh, not just aviation. Uh, we do accidents. Uh, and incidents in marine uh, safety as well, and of course with bridges and other highway infrastructure. And for this, there were many that were Im affected uh, by this collapse, and our deepest sympathies uh, go out to the uh, families, loved ones, and others who have been affected. I'm going to get questions on fatalities and injuries, which I'm not going to answer. Uh, that is not something that the NTSB answers. I will refer you to local authorities on all of that information. What I can tell you is a search and rescue is still underway. Uh, so we are very hopeful. And again, our thoughts uh, are with the families and their loved ones. Again, we got here at 6 a.m. Uh, and we are standing back uh, to allow the uh, Coast Guard and search and rescue to continue their search and rescue operations while we gather information from the command post. 
there is a lot of information that we can uh, begin to collect. We have a team of 24 on scene, including uh, Member Brown and uh, me. Uh, the team of experts include experts in nautical operations and what they're going to look at and begin to collect is information on vessel operations safety history safety record the look at the owner uh the look at the operator and the look at the operations this day at, at, today they will also look at company policy, any sort of safety management system, uh, system or safety management program will be looked at by them and our human performance team as well. We have a human performance expert here. Uh, we have an engineering uh, team, we have survival factors, and then we have a team here uh, that is getting the recorders. We also have a highway safety team, our team out of the Office of Highway Safety, including structural engineers, uh, bridge experts who will be here uh, and are continuing to come in. We have a few here and uh, one or two others are coming in in the next few hours. Jennifer Hammondy is chair of the NTSB National Transportation Safety Board news conference in Baltimore. More from the Baltimore Sun article, the independent federal agency, NTSB, is responsible for investigating disasters involving marine traffic, highways, airplanes, and railways. Under federal regulations, major marine casualties are incidents that lead to the loss of six or more lives, the loss of a vessel weighing 100 tons or more, property damage above $500,000, or a serious threat to life, property, or the environment. The NTSB's Office of Marine Safety is charged with determining the likely cause of each major casualty event and identifying safety recommendations. You're listening to Washington Today. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., writes NPR, has announced a wealthy California attorney as the running mate for his independent presidential campaign, a necessary step as he tries to get on state ballots for November. Nicole Shanahan, 38 years old, is the president and director of the Baya Echo Foundation, a charitable organization that says it focuses its investments in reproductive longevity and equality, criminal justice reform, and a healthy and livable planet. Kennedy is the son of the former U.S. Attorney General and nephew of former President John F. Kennedy. He's a longtime environmental lawyer, but has become known in recent years for his anti-vaccine advocacy and as a promoter of conspiracy theories. That was reporting from National Public Radio. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. introduced Nicole Shanahan today at a rally in Oakland, California. I wanted someone who was battle-tested, able to withstand criticism and the controversy and all the defamations and slanders and perjuries that are thrown against anyone who embarks on a presidential campaign. I wanted an advocate who has seen corruption of our regulatory agencies firsthand, who shares my indignation about the way it allows regulated industries to commoditize our food, our wildlife, and our children. I wanted someone who would honor the traditions of our nation as a nation of immigrants, but who also understands that to be a nation, we need secure borders. I... I wanted a partner who was a gifted administrator, but also possesses the gift of curiosity, an open, inquiring mind, and the confidence to change even her strongest opinions in the face of contrary evidence. I wanted someone with a spiritual dimension and compassion and idealism, and above all, a deep love for the United States of America. I found all of those qualities in a woman who grew up right here in Oakland, the daughter of immigrants who overcame every daunting obstacle and went on to achieve the highest levels of the American dream. So that is why I'm so proud to introduce to you the next Vice President of the United States, my fellow lawyer, a brilliant scientist, technologist, a fierce warrior mom, Nicole Shanahan. 
Robert F. Kennedy Jr., independent presidential candidate at a rally in Oakland, California, and that vice presidential pick, Nicole Shanahan, also gave a speech. And one of the issues she talked about was chronic disease. There is only one candidate I have met for president who takes the chronic disease epidemic seriously. It is Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And I will be his ally in making our nation healthy again. Yes. Yes. It is not about a new pill or, quote, finding the cure. We know the cure is cleaning up our environment and providing the basic public goods that are the foundational conditions for health and healing. It is about a shift in our priorities. It is about compassion. Chronic disease, addiction, poverty, depression, this is where Americans are hurting the most. It is time for politicians to listen. So here is how the Kennedy-Shanahan ticket is going to end the chronic disease epidemic. While Bobby is focused on ending the corporate capture of our regulatory agencies, I am going to assemble the best technologists and scientists in the world, and we will use the latest in AI and computation and examine the health records databases of our nation and those other nations who are also on a quest to solve chronic disease. We will find the answers. We will find the answers to our most pressing health concerns within weeks, not decades. We can if we have access to those databases. Nicole Shanahan in Oakland, California, after independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. announced she would be his vice presidential running mate. Again, from the National Public Radio article on this announcement, Nicole Shanahan They write, has no political experience, but deep ties to California's tech industry and was once married to Google co-founder Sergey Brin. She has also given money previously to Democrats, including President Biden, but recently has been a key financial backer of a pro-Kennedy super PAC, contributing $4 million to help the group air a $7 million ad during the Super Bowl. That from NPR. (laughs) Wall Street today, the Dow down 31, Nasdaq down 68, S&P down 14. Reuters has an article, Visa and MasterCard reached an estimated $30 billion settlement to limit credit and debit card fees for merchants, with some savings likely to be passed on to consumers through lower prices. The antitrust settlement is one of the largest in U.S. history, and upon court approval would resolve claims in litigation that began in 2005. Merchants have long accused Visa and MasterCard of charging inflated swipe fees or interchange fees. When shoppers use credit or debit cards and barring them through anti-steering rules from directing customers toward cheaper means of payment. That reporting from Reuters. Washington Today continues in a moment. Hi there, I'm Jonathan from C-SPAN, along with my colleague, Ben. Since C-SPAN's founding 45 years ago, the media world has changed. Remember when there were just a few TV channels? Now we've got streaming, social media, apps, and more. Through all of this, C-SPAN has stayed true to its mission of giving you unfiltered access to government wherever you get your news. As we navigate this challenging media environment with fewer people subscribing to traditional cable packages, our funding has been impacted. That's why we're asking for your help to keep going strong for another 45 years. Please donate today at cspan.org slash donate. Your contribution, large or small, helps ensure at least another 45 years of witnessing democracy in action. Keep C-SPAN thriving in today's ever-changing media landscape. Visit cspan.org slash donate to make your gift today. Thank you. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the C-SPAN Now mobile app and wherever you find your podcasts. Story from AP, U.S. defense leaders met with Israel's Minister of Defense on Tuesday as the United States warns against a ground invasion of the southern Gaza city of Rafah. But rising tensions between the two allies put any progress in question. 
In remarks at the start of the Pentagon meeting, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said they would discuss alternative ways to target Hamas and Rafah, and he described civilian casualties in Gaza as far too high and aid deliveries as far too low. But he repeated the belief that Israel has the right to defend itself, and the U.S. would always be there to help. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, meanwhile, emphasized the ongoing threats to Israel and said the meeting would address ways to destroy Hamas and get the Israeli hostages released, as well as plans to return displaced residents to their homes. Austin made no mention of threats to limit or condition future military aid to Israel on humanitarian gains, a growing sentiment among members of Congress and others. And Gallant only said that the meeting would include discussions about the important cooperation between the two countries to ensure Israel's military edge and capabilities. That was from Associated Press. Here is part of what the two leaders said, starting with Secretary Austin. Now, it's been nearly six months since the Hamas atrocities of October 7th, the worst day in Israel's history. No country should endure such terror, and no country would tolerate such danger. So President Biden has been clear. Israel has a right to defend itself like any other state. So we're working with Israel to ensure that an outrage like October 7th can never happen again. And the United States will not rest until all the hostages are home. Our goal is to make Israel and the region safer and more secure. And as I have consistently said, protecting Palestinian civilians from harm is both a moral necessity and a strategic imperative. In Gaza today, the number of civilian casualties is far too high, and the amount of humanitarian aid is far too low. Gaza is suffering a humanitarian catastrophe, and the situation is getting even worse. We need immediate increases in assistance to avert famine, and our work to open a temporary humanitarian corridor by sea will help, but the key is still expanding aid deliveries by land. So, Mr. Minister, I look forward to discussing how we can dramatically and urgently uh, ease the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. The safety of the 1.5 million Palestinian civilians in Rafah is also a top priority for the United States. Now, we continue to share the goal of seeing Hamas defeated. So we'll discuss alternative approaches to target Hamas elements. And we must also plan for Israel's security after this conflict ends. And that includes working in renewed cooperation with the Palestinian Authority and our regional partners to stabilize Gaza and to move toward a two-state solution. You have your security bond is our security bond is unshakable. The United States is Israel's closest friend, and that won't change. And so I look forward to a good discussion today. And again, thanks for being here, Mr. Minister. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin at the Pentagon at a meeting with the Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant. Over the past six months, uh, we have been fighting a war against uh, a brutal terror organization, Hamas, which is the ISIS of Gaza. Uh, we also face attacks from seven different fronts, uh, all led by Iran. Uh, while I sit here, in the Pentagon, Hamas leader Ania is meeting with Iranian leadership. Uh, the picture is clear. Who is well? Uh, today, we will discuss uh, developments in Gaza and the means to achieve our goals, the destruction of Hamas organization and bringing back the Israeli hostages back home. Uh, the negotiation on the hostages issue and Hamas positions require us to join hands in, the, in our military and diplomatic uh, efforts and to increase pressure uh, on Hamas. I will also raise the growing threats on our uh, northern border and uh, our commitment to uh, returning displaced uh, communities to their homes. Um, we will also discuss strategic issues and uh, the important uh, cooperation between, between our establishment, which will ensure 
Israel's military edge and uh, capabilities. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant at the Pentagon with Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and General C.Q. Brown, Chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. This meeting was scheduled before Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu canceled an Israeli delegation's trip to Washington after the U.S. on Monday during a United Nations Security Council resolution calling for a ceasefire in the war between Israel and Hamas abstained rather than using its veto and the resolution passed 14 to zero. Great Britain, which also has veto powers, a permanent member of the UN Security Council, voted yes on that ceasefire resolution yesterday. And today, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, head of the Conservative Party, got a question about it by another member of parliament from the Conservative Party, Stephen Crabb. How is a ceasefire resolution that contains not a word of condemnation of Hamas or any conditionality around hostage release consistent with our previous position and the language you've previously used about Hamas being evil and needing to see them militarily defeated. Yes, I I can appreciate uh, concern on that point. I can very much appreciate that. And as I said, it it is close to our position. It's not a perfect replication of it um, on Hamas in particular. And I think, as, as you know, I've been unequivocal and consistent in condemning Hamas, and we will always do that. Um, on hostages, though, you know, the way that I read the resolution and the way I think it should be read is that it does recall that the taking of hostages is obviously prohibited under international law, and it also demands the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages, and that was important. You know, this is not an unconditional ceasefire. This is a temporary pause, which is consistent with our position, alongside the, as I said, in the words of the resolution, immediate and unconditional release of all hostages, and as well as ensuring that more humanitarian access and aid can flow in. That has been, I think you'd agree, my consistent (coughs) position on this. And that's why I felt that the wording, and the Foreign Secretary felt that the wording was, that whilst not perfect, close enough to our position that we should support it. I'm disappointed to see some reporting last night uh, that Hamas already saying that they're not engaging in conversations around hostage release, which tells you what the problem is. Um, you know, that it can't be right for hostages. No for them. It, it can't be right for hostages to be held like that, and it is reasonable for Israel to want to ensure its security and the safe return of its citizens, which is why we've always said this immediate temporary humanitarian pause needs to be accompanied by the unconditional release of the hostages so that we can then get more aid in. And unfortunately, um, you know, Hamas have, have not complied with that, and they're the ones that are responsible, and we should never lose sight of that. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak at today's liaison committee hearing in the British House of Commons, a regular event where committee chairs question the Prime Minister about both foreign and domestic issues. CNN in London reports that WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange has fended off the threat of immediate extradition to the United States after the High Court in London asked the U.S. for more assurances. U.S. authorities say that Assange, 52 years old, put lives at risk by publishing secret military documents and have for years been seeking his extradition on espionage charges. At a two-day hearing last month, Assange sought permission to appeal the U.K.'s 2022 approval of his extradition, arguing the case against him was politically motivated and that he would not face a fair trial. In a ruling Tuesday, a panel of two judges said Assange, an Australian citizen, would not be extradited immediately and gave the U.S. three weeks to give a series of assurances around Assange's First Amendment rights and that he would not receive the death penalty. That was from CNN. From the Moscow Times, a Moscow court on Tuesday extended the pretrial detention of U.S. journalist Evan Gershkovich until June 30th, ensuring that he will have spent more than one year behind bars following his arrest last year on espionage charges. Some reaction from the U.S. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller. Uh, today, Russian court extended his detention beyond one year until June, which m- one might argue that contradicts against even their own laws. You know, prosecutors are allowed to expand on the complex cases beyond one year, and they have claimed that this was not a complex case. He was, as they said at the very beginning, that you know, uh, captured red-handed, quote unquote. Um, what was your reaction, and have you re- received any evidence from Russia? during this one year. So let me just say that at the hearing today, Russian authorities did not provide any evidence of a crime. They just extended his detention for another three months. And despite their claims, they have provided no justification for holding him at all. And we believe there's a simple reason for doing that. It's because he has done nothing wrong. 
Uh, it's because journalism is not a crime. So we believe, <clears throat> as we have believed, that Russia should stop using individuals like Evan Gershkovich or Paul Whelan, uh, who has been detained for five years, uh, as bargaining chips. They should be released immediately. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller at his news conference at the State Department in Washington. NASA held a news conference today in D.C. about the total solar eclipse that will be passing through the United States April 8th, starting in Mexico, then 15 U.S. states, and then on to Canada. Over 30 million people live in the 115-mile-wide path of totality where the moon will block out the sun entirely for up to four and a half minutes. Associated Press article reads that the U.S. won't see another total solar eclipse on this scale until 2045, so NASA and everyone else is pulling out all the stops. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson said today a total eclipse is an awesome experience and a great opportunity for science experiments. It's a moment when millions of people across North America will look to the heavens as the moon passes in front and between the sun of the, and the earth. And it's a rare sight that we haven't seen in seven years. And unusual things start to happen as the normal rhythms of earth are disrupted. When you're seeing this eclipse, you ought to observe this. As the day appears to turn to dusk and then dark, people have heard birds stop singing. They've seen giraffes suddenly begin to gallop. Roosters start crowing and crickets chirp. So watch for these unusual behaviors. And we encourage you to help NASA observe the sights and sounds around you. Eclipses have a special power. They move people to feel a kind of reverence for the beauty of our universe. Their power is not only to unify us on Earth, but to further science and discovery. In 1919, Albert Einstein's theory of gravitational bending was proven when scientists measured how stars shift when the sun is blocked out by the moon. And today, over a century later, a total solar eclipse still brings great opportunity and science. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson at an eclipse news conference at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. He also stressed the importance, if you're going to be viewing the eclipse, of eye protection. Never look directly at the sun, even during an eclipse, only through approved eclipse glasses or handheld solar viewers with the proper filters to filter out the sun's harmful UV and infrared rays. And as for those experiments, NASA says they will include studying the sun's corona and the sun's effect on the Earth's upper atmosphere and radio communications. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Subscribe to C-SPAN's free evening newsletter, Word for Word, and you'll get the stories making headlines in Washington sent to your inbox every day. Sign up at cspan.org connect. Have a good night. <music>